This conference will now be recorded. You good to go, Morgan? Perfect. Yep. Yes, so um, first of all, hi everybody. My name is Morgan Fouracre and I work for Balfour BT Rail um, on the London Street Overbridge project. So this is what I'm going to be uh, focusing my presentation on today. Um, the bridge itself spans over platform 11 and 12 and it is a refurbishment project. So what I'm going to touch on is, is the structure itself. So give a quick overview, um, the remit and the key components and also the scope. Um, So on the left hand side, you've got Paddington Station in green and the yellow arrow highlights London Street itself. On the right hand side, you can see um, a street view of London Street. So in the yellow area, that's that's where the structure sits below the below the highway. Um, on the left hand side, we've got St. Mary's Hospital and on the right hand side, we've got Paddington Station. So. In terms of the structure itself, uh, it was built in 1912. Um, so that was spans A and B. So as you can see in the bottom left hand side here, I've got a plan view of the structure. So we've got the first span is A, then we've got span B and span C. So the first two spans A and B were both built in 1912 and span C uh, was rebuilt in 1950s following bomb, bomb damage during World War II. And essentially we have been contracted um, as a um, as a project through Network Rail, so they are a client, and we are working on the strengthening of this structure. So the the structure is a steel um, grillage, and it is clad extensively in brickwork. So all of the brickwork surrounding the steel is engineering blue brick, so it is providing lateral stability to the bridge, and it's also helping um, support the vertical live and dead loads. And then as well, the, the structure is also subject to lateral loads, so the bridge itself spans in between the hospital and the main canopy for Paddington Station, which transfers a 100 ton um, point load in the horizontal direction on each cross girder. So that's some, another, another issue that we're facing at the moment. So here's the 3D model of the structure. Um, so our scope is to repair the, the main cross girders, which is shown in red. So we're strengthening these um, for a it's a steel prep and paint system um, with overplating on the webs and flanges. So we've got four main cross girders that we're working on. All of the longitudinal girders in between um, have to be replaced and all of the yellow RSJs in between those are going to be getting pulled out with a flat slab over the top. So yeah, the scope of work is strengthen four main cross girders um, via the network rail standard uh, strengthening detail replacing all the longitudinal beams, removing the brick jack arches and the masonry cladding. And we're also um, preparing and painting all the steel work and installing a new waterproofing system. So to support that scope of works, um, we started last January in Paddington Station. So we did all the enabling works and pushed the buffer stops, the track circuit arrangements and all of the OLE uh, 30 meters down the line. We've created a hoarding, we've installed a hoarding system, which has created a high street environment for us to work in. And we've also got a traffic management system and a monitoring system in place. We've got a significant amount of temporary works in place to support the corroded structure. And we've undertaken a vast amount of SI works to verify the actual condition of the steel um, in behind the brickwork. And then as well, we've got a, a number of utilities in the deck itself, which we're gonna be looking to divert. So I'm now going to touch on um, current works, works we're doing at the moment on site, um, upcoming works and stuff we've um, done over the past year. So to start with site establishment. So um, as I mentioned, all the buffer, stop, the buffer stops, OLE and track circuit arrangements have been pushed down the line. Um, so you can see in the bottom left hand side photo there, that's the new position of the buffer stops. We've created a, a high street environment. So we've got a full hoarding setup now on platform 11 and 12. Um, which has allowed us to work a uh, completely high street environment. So it's a non-rail job. We've removed all of the track furniture and that is essentially our site establishment. So due to the condition of the structure um, and all of the all of the structural brickwork, we've had to reduce the live loading on the bridge. So we've implemented a one-way system. So the one-way system now follows up London Street and along uh, South Wharf Road. So yeah, the dead load could not be reduced due to ongoing assessment of brickwork restraint. So we have Arup as our permanent works designer um, and they are 
they're working hard on getting a design across uh, to remove additional brickwork from the bridge. Uh, full road closure is required for the construction joints and plant public interface safety. So when we're looking at all of our lift plans and everything else. And then finally, um, London Street is an emergency route, so it is a blue light route. Um, so we're working closely with Westminster City Council and the NHS to come up with a, um, an effective way to conduct the works. So part of this project, um, we will be closing London Street off and we will be opening up a new road called Norfolk Place. So the, the bottom left diagram here is the um, it's a private road Norfolk Places. And what we're looking to do is open it up to emergency traffic only. We are working on a detailed design um, for that at the moment. But, um, in terms of steel work, so cross girders A and B are both in, in very poor condition. Um, so the original design assumption was that steel work, um, I guess, suffered four mil section loss per face on the web. Um, since kind of being on site and doing all our SI work, we found that um, both A and B are in, in much worse condition. The longitudinal girders are also significantly corroded, um, which is not only affecting the permanent works design, but it's also affecting the ability to prop the structure up. Uh, so we've had to kind of modify the propping system throughout the job. And again, brickwork is adding a significant dead load to the structure. And then finally, we've installed a remote um, structure monitor. We've installed a um, we've installed a variety of tilt switches across the structure, which is part of our monitoring plan. So we've got uh, tilt switches in the, the mid span of all of the girders measuring deflection. And we've also got the uh, tilt switches measuring the torsional movement of the structure. Um, so kind of part of these works, if we do get any significant movement, um, we can kind of collectively with network rail um, look look at the results and, and see kind of um, whether, whether we need to close the road immediately or whether we need to close part of the station. This is the main part of work that we've we've done so far is the propping system. Um, so we've installed about 200 ton of steel work. Now, um, I guess the interesting thing about the propping system is it is supported uh, solely off the, the rail head. So all of the loads, all of the, um, the vertical live and dead loads from the bridge. So not just the dead load of all of the brickwork and the steel, but also the construction traffic and everything else. All of the loads are going to be taken through the propping system and they bear directly on the rail head. Um, and the reason, the reason why is because at the start of the project, um, it was really difficult to basically examine the exact ground conditions of the concourse and the track bed. We did a lot of SI work and um, in the end we've we've worked off the RA8 loading. Um, so the propping system itself is actually mimicking a train parked up in, in Paddington Station. So yeah, in the, the right hand side photo there you can see um, some finite element analysis that was done as part of the CAP3 check for the propping system to check the dynamic stresses on the rail head. Um, one current issue that we've got is the disconnections of the longitudinals. So for us to strengthen the cross girders at the far end of our work site, we have to disconnect two longitudinal girders to fit the plates in behind. Um, and the amount of preload that has to go through the girders is 250 kilonewtons um, at each point. So we're currently working on a, um, on a design to overcome this. We're looking at spreading the loads further out on the railhead. Um, and installing kind of spreader beams at a high level as well to kind of dissipate those loads. We've also installed a crash deck on platform 12, and that is in preparation for the construction works on the uh, St. Mary's side of the road. So we're looking to demolish the lean to to reduce the dead load on the structure. And then finally, we've installed a, a scaffold throughout the whole propping system. So yeah, that's, that's allowed us to install all of the jacks and do all of the SI works. Finally, I'll just touch on um, this item of temporary works, and that is the raking propping system um, that we are going to be doing at the back end of our construction sequence. I won't go into too much detail on this because it is uh, quite elaborate, but in terms of um, the loading on the structure, so we've got about 1,000 kilonewtons of loading acting in the horizontal direction. So when we come to start the main works, we are kind of entering into a really detailed demolition sequence. We've got to um, take off kind of small areas of brickwork and strengthen small patches at a time to increase the, um, 
capacity of the steelwork to basically take take this load. Um, once we've done all of the first phase of works, which is on the left hand side, we will then um, take all of our propping system out and look to install a raking prop to take the, the horizontal load in before we can start working on the right hand side of the structure. Um, so yeah, that is pretty much everything for me to be honest. Um, it's a re really complex project. I think it's the most complex on the western route on the western route for Balfour BT at the moment. Uh, so it's a really good project to be involved in. And if anyone would like to ask any questions, uh, feel free to do so. Thank you very much, Morgan. So Mike Barlow has a question. He says, "What information sources are investigated for information about the existing structure?" Sorry, can you just repeat that? So Mike asks, what information sources were investigated for information about the existing structure? Sorry, can you just repeat that one more time? I'm not coming through very well, sorry. I'll just uh, stop sharing to see if that helps. All right. What, what information sources were investigated for information about the existing structure? Yeah, so... Um, got that one so before we started uh, we got given all the detailed examinations and visual examinations um, from network rail um, these were kind of based on very limited si works and that was um, essentially just local breakout points on the girders um, but because of kind of access and everything else is an operational an operational line and all the OLE was in place um, it was kind of limited um, they were also they also couldn't kind of break off too much brickwork at the start. So again, it was kind of limited. So the whole kind of design has progressed based on record drawings, um, and those assumptions have been carried carried throughout. Okay, thank you, Mike Barlow. Also asks, have you had to engage with local residents about the works? Yes, we have. Yes, so Network Rail are our client, um, and obviously it is a blue light route. Um, and closing kind of London Street is a um, is, is not the best thing to do, to be honest, in terms of managing traffic around that area of, um, of the station and providing emergency access as well. Um, but saying that the bridge is in um, a really poor condition and the works do, do need to take place, so um, Network Rail are kind of liaising with all of our stakeholders on an ongoing basis um, to try and, it hasn't been formally agreed yet, the road closure, but we are kind of working on a design and until we get that detailed design through, uh, I don't think Westminster will be kind of willing to comment on the on the kind of design. Okay, what is your role on the project? Yes, so um, I'm a graduate engineer, um, so I started with Balfour's a year and a half ago on the graduate scheme. Um, so originally I was based over in Exeter um, for a few months, just working on this job, and then I moved over to London. So yeah, I'm a graduate engineer, I'm looking to move into a into a kind of site engineer role, section engineer role. Okay. Paul Evans if the girders are in worse condition than expected, is there consideration on replacing them too? Yes. So it was considered um, at the very start, um, kind of. At the initial design stage, we were looking to replace the cross girders in their entirety. I think a lot of um, subcontractors, Network Rail, have got a, a quite a detailed um, strengthening standard. Um, so we have had a lot of subcontractors on site, and they are quite they are um, where they are hopeful. We've done a lot of weld tests, and we've done a lot of material sampling as well. Um, so we've got the evidence there that they can be strengthened. But saying that, we have, we have looked at replacing them, but due to the lateral loads that I mentioned. Um, the 1,000 kilometres below each end of the cross girder. It's really difficult to replace them. Um, as you can imagine, if you if you pull a girder out that's subject to 1,000 kilonewtons at the end, um, you're going to kind of get a, um, an overturning moment at the top of the column, and that column supports a, a continuous truss that supports the the, um, the large barrel roof for Paddington. So, so yeah, it has been considered, um, but we are progressing with a strengthening design due to the I guess the, the program implications. Okay. okay. Finally, Zoe asks, what implications to passenger service are there in pushing the track 30 metres away? 
that seems a lot at a busy mainline station. Yes, so all of the enabling works were done by Network Rail um, Christmas before last, so just over a year and a half ago. Um, so they were done during possession works, all the buff stops, track circuit arrangement and OLE got pushed forward. Um, so it was kind of conducted um, over Christmas. So obviously while the station was pretty quiet. Um, but since then, obviously we've installed, a, we've installed our hoarding system. So it's high street environment. So we are kind of minimizing our impact on the station. Obviously, once we do get a full road closure, um, again, all of our access is going to be top down. So we're going to be looking to lift out all of the existing steel work and replace it um, using a top down construction method. So, again, we'll be minimizing our disruption on the station. OK, thank you. <laughs> no problem to Final call. No, OK, thank you very much. Could we have Thanks, a presenter, please, Flavia? Yes, I'm going to share. Can you all see this? Yep, we can see it. Yep. There you go. Okay. Thank you. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Flavia Giurga. I am a graduate civil engineer at Keoli Sami Docklan, and I'm working within the civil team for the structures maintenance of the Docklands Light Railway Network. So one of the duties of a civil engineer is to ensure their work is safe and to ensure people's safety. So this is why today my presentation will be about the installation of a new access platform at the DLR Poplar Depot. And this access platform was required for the safe and easy access of personnel working or running stocks. So during my presentation today, I will go through these contents. I will uh, give an introduction to the project, so how this project started. Then I will present the design ideas, uh, including some details and, uh, of course, the expected uh, final result. And to conclude, I will summarize the most important parts of the project. So here we are, so the project started from an issue, from a safety issue raised by the operational team. This issue was raised in this location. It is one of the depot sidings, and it, this is the current situation, and it is possible to notice the steep height our operational colleagues have to climb to get on and off the trains every time. And so this current situation presents some uh, health and safety risks, for example, trip hazards, and also to notice that uh, many operational colleagues work uh, during night, so with uh, limited um, light. And, uh, but most of all, this current situation does not allow for human factors. The engineering solution to, this, to solve this issue is to install this type of access platform uh, made of glass-reinforced uh, plastic, GRP, that is lightweight, it is resistant, it is perfectly designed for a depot area because the GRP material it uh, does not con um, conduct electricity. So given that we are working track size, so we want to install this platform uh, near uh, track areas, we have many track assets or signaling assets that carry electricity, so we want to provide a safe solution also, we are trying to solve another safety issue, so we don't want to create other safety risks. Uh, also, this uh, GRP material is uh, corrosion and weather resistant, so it makes the platform easy to maintain in the future. Again, uh, the, not to forget about the importance of the maintenance, and so to take this uh, aspect in consideration also uh, during the design phase of any type of project. Just to give an idea of the location, so we are at the London DLR Poplar Depot. Here is a closure view on the depot and the sidings. Uh, basically, when this depot was designed and built, they didn't take in consideration the procedures in this location here where now the, the safety issue was raised. Here is a closure view on the location. Two, 
uh, identify then the perfect, the exact uh, position of the access platform to be installed. We took as reference the preferred stopping position of the train on these sidings. And so we took in consideration two main points, one from uh, the front view and one from the rear view. So as mentioned earlier, here is the area of interest highlighted in red. It's possible to see also here on this drawing. And we took in consideration uh, as reference other two elements. So one is the existing walkway on uh, one side and, uh, and the existing track edge beam on the other side. The, um, at the moment, in this location, we have only soil and ballast. And the first phase of the project will be to create a concrete platform to act as a flat and safe um, surface. And so the first phase will be to remove the soil and the ballast for a depth of 200 millimeters. Well, this will have to be in, for, in a level with the walkway and with the edge beam. And then to create the concrete platform instead. Again, still a flashed with the walkway and with the edge beam to avoid gaps and so trip hazards or other safety issues. As mentioned earlier, we are trying to sort out uh, safety issues, issues, so we don't want to create others, new risk, uh, risk. Here is a section of the current situation. Uh, so once we will remove these 200 millimeters of soil and ballast, the remaining um, soil will be compacted to receive first an aggregate base. This aggregate base will be 100 millimeters uh, deep and will be compacted as well to receive a concrete layer on top. The concrete layer will have uh, will be still 100 millimeters deep, and we will use um, C25 concrete mix and an A142 anti-cracking reinforcement mesh with six millimeters bars. As mentioned earlier, the concrete layer will have to be flashed with the walkway and with the edge beam to avoid trip hazards. The slope of the concrete base will have to follow the slope of the walkway. And also this concrete base um, shall include um, hand tool transverse joints to allow the concrete to expand and contract uh, without damages. So once the concrete base will be created, we are expecting to have something uh, like this. Here are the expansion joints. And once the concrete will be dry and ready to receive the access platform, we will align the train as indicated at the beginning uh, using a res reference, the two points, front view and from the rear view. And we will install the access platform in accordance with the door openings and in accordance with the track clearance uh, drawings. Once the installation will be completed, we will provide a stop mark signage on the four foot area to facilitate the alignment of trains with the platform in the future. So this is what the, the result that we are expecting. And uh, the moment we are dealing with the contractors to carry out the works, especially when um, the contractors will be agreed and work, all the works will be agreed, we will uh, use uh, the, the period of possession and so isolation to make sure that we can carry out the work safely. So to summarize, uh, this project started from a safety issue raised by the operational department regarding a human factor. The engineering solution was agreed engaging with the health and safety representatives to make sure that we meet all the needs. Uh, the design idea was still planned in collaboration with other departments, such as track team and signaling team, to make sure that um, we, we won't have future interfaces with other assets. The construction process will uh, <clears throat> consist in mostly two phases. So the one phase, first phase will be to create this concrete base uh, to ensure additional stability to the access platform. 
to act as a, a flat and safe uh, surface. The second phase will be then to install the access platform itself. The result that you are expecting, obviously, is to have uh, huge health and safety improvements. And what I wanted to show with this, with this project is that uh, even a small project can ensure the safety of personnel working trackside and on running stocks. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Fabia. Okay, I have a few questions for you. So, yes. what I would like to ask, were short piles considered, sorry, it's just disappeared. Were short it's piles considered for the foundation rather than a slab? This may have avoided the need to remove the existing soil and ballast. Uh, sorry, uh, did I miss the first part? Mike asks, were short piles considered rather than the slab for the foundations? Uh, we consider various solutions. We didn't consider a piles, we consider maybe just some local uh, foundations for the, the piece of the, of the access platform. But no, we haven't considered the, the piles. Okay. Fiona Thompson asks, how will the platform be anchored to the concrete slab? So uh, yeah, this is more uh, based on the specification of the con of the platform. So it provides the bolts to be anchored to the concrete slab. So it's coming with bolts. Okay, thank you. Mike Barlow asks: Is the surface of the platform and the steps in the form of a grid to provide drainage? It, uh, uh, sorry, can you please repeat it? Is the surface of the platform and the steps in the form of a grid to provide drainage? Uh, yes, because it's like a grid. Yep. Okay. Alberto Carrera would like to ask, what would you say has been the key challenge that you personally had to deal with during this project? So, um, well, being a safety, probably, yeah, just for safety aspects, so make sure that is compliance and it is you know uh okay for the for a depot area to be safe and yeah, especially not to create other um safety issues okay james donald would like to ask once constructed what will be the max stepping distance between the platform and the train so this is why we will use the track clearance drawings uh, to limit this distance to make it as minimum as possible uh yet yeah, again to avoid gaps that can uh, lead to trip hazards it will okay. be based on the clearance drawings and finally paul abbott would like to ask what is the cost comparison between grp platforms and an equivalent galvanized steel alternative also what is the carbon footprint comparison um unfortunately i'm not able to, to to respond to this question from the cost point of view because uh i, I haven't compared the the two options as cost we already used uh, the grp platforms in other location that in the depot so um you know is the best solution for for ourselves for us okay thank you very much thank you all okay Richard, are you ready to go? Yep, all ready. I will share my screen with you all. Lovely, thank you. Okay. You should be able to see that now. Yep. Wonderful. Okay. Um, right, hi everyone. Good afternoon. So my name is Richard Stengel. Um, I'm a track engineer within track maintenance engineering at Transport for London. And the my presentation today is based around a project I'm involved with, which is seeking to upgrade the software that the rolling stock uses in determining the amount of applied traction. So essentially the force used to drive the train forward. Um, and my involvement in this is from a track perspective. So I'm gonna be looking at the effect um, that the modification has on the track. Um, and helping to determine whether it's having the desired output and ultimately a, a success or failure. So 
So a bit of background um, on the sort of need for the project. The most prevalent defect on London Underground is a squat. Um, so this is a rolling contact fatigue related defect, only found in the open sections. And it resembles a small depression in the rail head as if someone squatted down um, and left an imprint on top of the rail. So when a train travels over a section of track, if the traction, which is the force propelling that train forward, is sufficiently high, heavy shearing forces occur in the railhead, which can lead to small cracks developing. Over time, fluid can enter these cracks, which causes them to get bigger, and then they travel deeper into the rail. And this cycle then continues unless further action is taken. Um, so ultimately, these track, uh, sorry, these cracks can then lead to larger transverse defects if they're not dealt with and also lead to issues where other defects are masked because the rail becomes ultrasonically untestable. So you see this graph here. Over the last five years, this is a count of the number of squats recorded across London Underground. And these two images here show a squat in a bit more detail. So the image on the left is a close-up view of some of these uh, some of the cracks in the railhead developing. And the image on the right is the squat itself. So you can see the small depression um, as if someone has sort of sat on top of the rail um, and left, left the mark of their rear end behind. So our current process for detecting and managing these is to ultrasonically inspect the rail at set frequencies. And then we apply minimum action codes which are relevant to the severity uh, and the location of the defects. So currently rail grinding, head weld repair and re-railing are the three processes used in removing squats once they've been identified. So this table here just details some of the, the different actions that we have. So on the top, you'll see what's, uh, what's recur referred to as a 3M. So that's, um, that's essentially a, a do nothing but monitor. And then we have all the way down to a 1A, which involves applying uh, emergency speed limits, um, emergency fish plates, and removing that section of, uh, of track within 48 hours. So you can see those classifications are largely dependent on the size of the defect, and then also whether it falls within or outside of fish plate limits. So that image there is just one of a, uh, a head weld repair. So um, provided there's not multiple defects, um, up to sort of 25 millimeters deep, uh, a section of rail can be flame cut out um, and then filled back up and ground over. Okay, so the project itself, as I mentioned earlier, squats are caused by the high rates of applied traction, which results in heavy shearing forces. So a good way to visualize this is if you're driving your car, uh, if you were driving on a, on a dry summer's day, the amount of pressure you put on the accelerator would be different compared with driving on an icy winter's day. Um, if you drove the same way in both scenarios, you're likely to cause skidding, loss of control, and a reduction in the driving force pushing the car forward. Um, rolling stock's no different. So certain times of year, mainly sort of October to December, we have the leaf fall season, um, which can significantly impact surface adhesion. So this, the end result of this is higher levels of traction um, if, if trains are struggling to grip um, due to leaves, wet leaves on the line. So this modification is designed to account for this and adjust accordingly the levels of traction that the train is applying. So as a track community, what we need to know is what impact is this modification having on the track? Um, is it reducing the number of squats? Um, and are there any other consequences happening uh, as a result of this? So yes, leaf pool season, uh, it happens every year. Just severity uh, obviously varies year on year. So what I did to begin with, uh, I had to establish which trains were going to have this upgrade installed on first. Um, so eventually it was decided it was going to get installed on the S stock fleet, 
and this fleet travels on the district line, the Hammersmith and City line and the Metropolitan line. Um, however, for now, it was only going to get rolled out on the S8 variant, which travels exclusively on the Metropolitan line. So some sections of the Met line are shared with other fleets. So I needed to identify somewhere that only the S8 uses um, that was in the open. So I knew it would suffer with squats that also would suffer with the leaf fall season and also experienced enough tonnage that the inspection frequency was relatively frequent. So the section of track I chose to focus on was between Pinner and Northwood. So you'll see up here in the bottom right of that image, we've got the centre of London. So we are uh, right up in the countryside in the northwest there. Uh, it's around about a three and a half kilometre long section. And currently the ultrasonic inspection frequency is about 77 days. So with this location in mind, I've been able to analyse some of the historic defects from our database, uh, as well as identifying any others that have been flagged for monitoring due to their perceived low risk. Uh, and then I've been able to build up a picture of the squat history at this site. So, as I mentioned, the rail defect database uh, that keeps a track of all of our historic defects. Uh, some of the inspection records. So, as I mentioned earlier, those that are recorded as a 3M, where they're just monitored, uh, they are kept in here. And some of the other systems um, I've accessed is the include the historic grinding data. So dates when a grind has been carried out on that section of rail, and also a system called Apollo. Um, so Apollo is a system that records train condition data. Um, some of these trains have a system uh, called WSP, which is wheel skid protection, and it's a good indicator of poor rail adhesion. So from this system, I've been able to uh, download uh, each time that that system has been activated, um, which is kind of a good indicator of if you have more activations, it's generally consistent with a, uh, a poorer level of adhesion on the railhead. So you can see here, this is our rail defect database. Uh, the different colours just represent on the section of track I've chosen. It's split up into four different areas. Um, so you've got a northbound and a southbound, and then there's two, um, two inspection zones back to back. This along the bottom here, this is the, uh, again, this is the record of just the, the defects that only warranted monitoring. And here you've got the, the count of um, WSP activation, so the wheel skid protection activation. So what I was able to do was standardise this data to make it a bit easier for comparison. And then this has allowed me to forecast a trend line. So you'll see on here, this trend line indicates the projection if we were to do nothing bar carry on as we are. So I'm going to be using this uh, to help monitor when the defect roll, uh, sorry, when the upgrade rolls out, continue to track the number of defects and the number of monitoring defects uh, and see where it fits in with this trend line. You'll see here, I've got another graph um, with the wheel skin protection activations. Um, what you'll notice though, is that they are on separate graphs. So some of the problems that I've encountered with this we've got track data and train data. And although they're both very useful, they don't necessarily talk the same language. Um, so regarding the track data, the location referencing system that's used isn't used by the train data. Um, so you'll see on the graph for the WSP, it references the station. Um, what that information can tell me is the last station that train traveled through but it doesn't tell me the direction. So um, it's useful information, um, perhaps not the most accurate though. Uh, so something else that has been, uh, been a slight hiccup is I'm relatively new to exploring the dark arts of statistical analysis. 
So some of this data is a little bit rough around the edges, um, but the concept is there. So the next steps with this then, once we know uh, an exact date that this is going to get rolled out onto the trains, um, we want to grind the track uh, as close as possible to that rollout date and then ultrasonically inspect the track so we can get an image of what is in the track at the time of rollout. Um, ideally, this will be just before the modifications installed on the trains. Um, however, track access is likely um, to play some uh, larger role in determining when this is conducted. Once the grinding has happened, uh, we'll ultrasonically inspect the track just to know what's in the rail, and then we can begin monitoring at the specified frequency, uh, ideally for sort of 18 to 24 months, um, so we can hope for a, a good a good couple of leaf fall seasons. Uh, and then after that, we can start to review the data and compare that against the forecast. So hopefully be able to determine the effectiveness on the upgrade on squat generation. Um, so the theory behind it is that we should see a reduction in the number of squats, uh, regardless of whether we have a heavy leaf fall or not. Um, but as I said, this is a work in progress, so time will tell. Um, and yeah, so there we have uh, rail grinding taking place. And that is a B-scan ultrasonic um, inspection kit. So that's what will be used to conduct the inspections on the track. So thank you very much. Thank you, Richard. So I have a few questions for you. Uh, Fiona Thompson would like to ask, what is the current life expectancy of a flame cut rail slash refill repair? Um, life expectancy, I, uh, <laughs> I can't give you an answer on that one. Um, I do know it's an approved process though. So it's provided the, the defect, it's um, the, the defect that has been cut out isn't beyond 25 millimeters of depth then it's, it's a suitable method um, for preventing an entire re-rail. Um, obviously, the, a re-rail would replace a bigger section of rail, but ultimately it's a more expensive option. Um, so if there is an isolated defect that hasn't yet fully propagated down into the track, um, flame cutting of head weld repair, I should say, is an acceptable method um, of repairing that. Okay, thank you. Mike Barlow would like to ask, why was a specific site selected for monitoring of squats? Once the traction software is updated, won't there be an overall reduction of squats across the routes where SDOP operates? That's the theory. Um, obviously, to begin with, it, it, to make sure that it was actually, uh, that it is this that is causing the reduction, um, decided to focus on a on a, a sort of smaller isolated section um where we can perhaps control some more of the variables so obviously if the if the site that we were monitoring all of a sudden was ground and we weren't aware of it then a large number of defects would be removed under that process and that wouldn't necessarily be a, as a result of the uh, modification so deciding on a on a smaller area of track to focus on um, hopefully it's going to allow us to uh, have a bit more accurate data collected. Okay, thank you. Mike would also like to ask, will the modified traction software reduce the energy consumption of the motors? Um, that's a very good question, um, but it's not one for me to answer. Um, obviously, I'm looking at this purely from a track perspective, so as far as the, the impact on the rolling stock power consumption, um, I'm not uh, not too sure on that one. Okay, and finally, Alberto Carrera would like to ask, how would you define your impact to the project? Um, so I have been uh, very busy sort of looking into the, uh, the sort of historic defects on this to try and build up um the sort of baseline of this really um it's it's not something i had a huge amount of experience with before so it's it's um it's definitely helped me understand things better and i, and I like to think that that my involvement in this has definitely made um or will make the overall decision or final decision on on the project's merits um 
be more impactful. Okay, thank you. Uh, that's the end of the presentations. I'd like to thank all the presenters. They were three very interesting talks. We'll now have a short interlude where the judges go in away and deliberate privately, and I'll give you some warning when they come back to make a decision. Thank you.